I've never struggled to comprehend the speed at which a year has passed in the way I have with 2022. As I've gotten older, each year has felt a bit shorter than the last, but this past one accelerated that feeling to an alarming degree. And I think a large part of that is due to me experiencing a pretty huge transition in life. That of going from a guy who talks about video games on the internet to a guy who talks about video games on the internet and also has a kid. 2022 was the most important and challenging year of my life. And as always, in order to process and cope with the stresses I experienced, I played a lot of video games. Some were new, some were old, but all of them undoubtedly helped me throughout the year in various ways, and I want to spend some time talking about them. So these are the games that got me through 2022, and as is tradition now, the only place to start is the start, with the first game I played last year, Webbed. Every January, I typically look for a comfy game to play, something that doesn't take too much thought and is largely designed to make players feel good, and Webbed filled that role well. What really makes the game tick is its use of movement, which centers around one of the most satisfying swinging mechanics I've seen in a game. It takes actual thought and some skill to get moving efficiently, but is still forgiving enough that it never gets frustrating. Webbed was a cute and calm way to kick off the year, the sort of low stakes game that recenters you a bit, one that I didn't have to invest all that much time or energy into, but still got a great sense of satisfaction for experiencing. And at the time, I expected to seek out more titles like it throughout the year, as I figured with the quickly approaching life change, they would be easy games to fit into a new schedule and also help manage stress levels on especially tough days. But that didn't really end up being the case. Despite Webbed being a delightful time and me thinking I wanted more of it, I quickly dove in the opposite direction for no real reason, and instead sought out games that challenged me in one way or another, ones where the enjoyment comes from the struggle, which led me to what ended up being my favorite game I played last year, FromSoft's greatest masterpiece, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. I'm not proud to admit this, but I actually bought Sekiro the day it came out and refunded it after an hour, as I just wasn't mentally in a place where I was willing to deal with excessive amounts of failure. But last January, I finally was. After jumping back into it, I still found the game to be wildly difficult, but instead of feeling demoralized by it, this time I felt encouraged. In a way, and I'm sure I'm not the first or last person to say this, it reminded me of the first time I played a Souls game. When I originally tried out Demon Souls over a decade ago, I had never played anything like it. I was used to combat where you could almost always get by with button mashing and the occasional well-timed dodge, but Demon Souls asked so much more from me, and I had to shed habits I had developed from other games in order to master it. However, after playing through the Dark Souls series and Bloodborne, I pretty much figured out what to expect from FromSoft combat, and what had once been fresh and unique became ordinary. But Sekiro doesn't adhere to the typical Soulsborne formula. While the influence of those games can clearly be felt, it challenges all players, from newcomers to die-hard FromSoft fans, to master new mechanics and strategies that are far different than almost anything they've seen before. Sekiro managed to recreate the feeling that got me to fall in love with FromSoft in the first place by being so different from their other titles in terms of gameplay. It surprised me in a way that few games ever do, while still feeling familiar and comfortable by including many of the trappings I expect to see in FromSoft titles. It reminded me of how much I love the feeling of becoming good at a game, of learning its systems and inner workings and engaging with as many mechanics as possible in order to overcome its challenges. Since starting this channel, I've often fallen into a pattern of just playing through games to play through them, to have something to talk about for these videos, but Sekiro pushed me to do more than that. It wasn't something I could get through on autopilot. I had to engage, I had to learn, and it reinvigorated my love of hard games. So. I kept playing them. After beating Sekiro, Sifu conveniently came out, which felt a lot like Sekiro, but that was exactly what I wanted. Something that kicked my ass until I actually took the time to figure it out. And then not long after beating that, Elden Ring released. And boy, did I play a lot of it. For a two week period, I lived in the lands between. With my wife's due date quickly approaching, I wanted to beat the game completely before my daughter was born, as I didn't know what things would be like after. And I have left enough games half finished to know that Elden Ring would have suffered the same fate if I took a substantial break from it. And I think this was the wrong way to play it. Elden Ring not only has the grandest scope I've ever seen in a game, but also an attention to detail that few titles ever achieve. And in my desire to check it off the list, I think I underappreciated a lot of what the world has to offer. To be clear, I did get all the achievements, so it isn't like I skipped past major content, but I never took the time to really soak things in. And now that some time has passed, it feels like something I consumed instead of truly 
engaged with. It's a once in a generation game and I feel like I kind of wasted it. Also due to the sheer number of hours I put in each day, certain aspects of it became a bit grating and frustrating because it's easier to spot and be annoyed by a title's flaws when you play it nonstop. That isn't to excuse the many real problems with Elden Ring, but I don't think they would have defined my experience as much had my play sessions been shorter and more spread out. To be honest though, even if I hadn't had the time constraint of an oncoming child, I probably would have played it in a similar way. Especially in the gaming content creator field, there is this pressure to be up to date with every major release, which I think drives a ton of people, myself included, to play games in suboptimal ways. I typically don't put out videos on brand new games as I am too slow of a video maker to do that, so there isn't really a reason for me to rush through things so much. But I often find it hard not to do, and it's almost always to my detriment. To be clear, I did still love Elden Ring. It was an experience unlike any other. I just wish I hadn't been so determined on putting it behind me. With that said, I do think it provided a much needed distraction to keep me from spiraling about all the things that get people to spiral during the final weeks of a pregnancy. It kept me occupied, and while the way I played it may have hurt my enjoyment of the game long term, it did get me through that time. A few days after getting my last achievement in Elden Ring, my daughter was born. And I didn't play anything for three weeks straight. Now, for some of you, that might not sound like much time at all, but for me, it is the longest stretch I've gone without playing a game for, I don't know, ever. Games have always been a big part of my life, and especially since starting this channel and then it turning into a job, they've become a part of my identity. I do do other things in life and have interests that aren't video games, but obviously games are important to me, so not playing anything for nearly a month felt weird and a little scary. During the first few weeks of parenthood, life changes completely, which is something every first-time parent knows will happen, but chances are they don't know what it'll look like or they don't know how it'll affect them. The combination of sleep deprivation and dedicating every waking moment to worrying about someone who can't take care of themselves is a hell of a thing. I knew my life would change, but for a time, I barely felt like a person at all, as my single function was to take care of my daughter. The idea of ever feeling some sense of regularity, of getting back to something that even partially resembled the life I had before, seemed impossible. I didn't know how to be myself. And then one day, while my daughter took a nap in her portable bassinet, I set her next to my desk and booted up Tunic. Tunic is a game that clearly loves other games, its most obvious inspiration being the NES Zelda titles, and it manages to capture a lot of the same energy of them without nearly as much of the frustration. There is a sense of mystery to the world, and in some ways, it is the game I wanted the original Legend of Zelda to be when I first played it as a kid. I won't talk about specifics as it is the kind of game that is better to know very little about before playing, but it is filled with clever puzzles and secrets that many players will never even realize are there. And the rewards for uncovering these things actually matter. A big part of what made Tunic the perfect game to play during that period was that even when I wasn't playing, I found myself thinking about the various mysteries, most notably the ones surrounding the mountain door and trying to solve them, which helped break up some of the monotony of changing diapers, washing bottles, and doing laps around the house while holding my daughter in the hopes of getting her to sleep. It's a rare title where ruminating on it between play sessions is part of the process, making it so I could be playing even when I wasn't actually playing, which had a lot of value for me. Whether it was because of the game itself or just that enough time had passed that I had grown a bit more used to my new responsibilities, playing through Tunic helped some normalcy return to my life. It was proof that I could still engage with my hobbies even if it looked a little different than it had before. I had been so stuck in a cloud of uncertainty that doing something as simple as playing and thinking about a video game brought me a surprising amount of relief. And after that, I got on a bit of a roll. I understood my daughter better and was figuring out how to properly attend to her needs. So I didn't feel like I was always a step behind. Maybe most importantly, she also started sleeping more, making it through the entire night from around the time she turned three months old, which every parent I've talked to has pretty much said never happens and that my wife and I are the luckiest parents in the history of parents, which is true. All of this gave me more time and less exhaustion, so I busted through a ton of games. Ratchet and Clank A Rift Apart provided a fun adventure to get lost in with an intuitive weapon progression system that I hope more games use. Neon White got me to spend far too much time replaying the same levels over and over again in order to do them faster than my friends, only for them to then immediately break my records with times I could never hope to get. Card Shark made me use my brain in a way I hadn't since having a kid, memorizing different tricks and recognizing patterns in order to cheat the French countryside out 
out of as much money as possible. A Link to the Past reminded me of just how good A Link to the Past is. Like, seriously, the fact that a game with this good of design came out in 1991 still kind of baffles me. And the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe proved that the best way to get a new perspective on things is by carrying a bucket. Regardless of the game, it was just nice to be playing things again. Being able to engage in something that had seemed impossible not long before felt both reassuring and liberating. When my daughter was born, I went into 100% dad mode, leaving little room for anything else. But as time went on, I learned how to better fuse being a dad with the person I was before. This stretch of playing a bunch of different titles did slow down considerably, but not because I wasn't spending as much time playing games. It was just that I spent most of my time playing one game, that being The Witcher 3. For those of you who watch a lot of my stuff, you've almost certainly picked up on the fact that I have a lot of problems with The Witcher 3. I've always respected its scope and story, but never really vibed with its approach to the open world. So when I finished it a few years back, I never planned to play it again. However, I ended up needing to do some research for a video I was working on, so I started a new adventure. Inspired by my enjoyment of the challenge of Sekiro, I decided to give Death March a try, which actually eased a handful of issues I had with The Witcher 3 when I first played on Sword and Story. As enemies hit a lot harder, and have far more health, I needed to find any advantage I could to not die immediately. So I engaged with more mechanics and side content than I did in my original run in order to be able to get through the challenges of the game. Also, for the majority of the time, I played with the minimap turned off, which the game is not designed for in the slightest and creates a host of other issues, but I did find myself having a better time when not relying on the corner of the screen to tell me exactly where to go. And you know what? Now, I kind of like The Witcher 3. I still have a lot of the same issues that I've always had, but with this different approach, Approach, I found a whole lot more to appreciate. I also finally played Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine, which in my opinion are both way better than the base game, and I have plans to talk about them more in a future video. All things considered, The Witcher 3 is still not my kind of game, but it did feel nice to be pulled in by its charm in a way I hadn't on my original playthrough. On this go, I took my time with it and did what I could to appreciate all the small details that make the world of The Witcher 3 feel so alive. I learned from my mistakes with Elden Ring and got a lot out of it because of that. For most of the summer, it was the main game I played, and it was nice to have a constant like that in my life, because during that period, it felt like I had a different baby every other day. I also found that the story of The Witcher 3 hit different now that I'm a dad. Geralt's father-daughter relationship with Ciri resonated with me a fair bit, and although I am certainly at a much different stage of parenthood, I couldn't help but connect with Geralt in a way I hadn't before. A similar thing happened with God of War 2018. I replayed it in preparation for Ragnarok, and was surprised to see how much my perception of the game had shifted. It didn't revolutionized my understanding of the story or anything that drastic, but where on my first playthrough I saw a lot of my past self in Atreus's coming of age story, in this one I mainly spent my time empathizing with Kratos' struggle of finding the right way to raise and connect with his kid. In both cases, it was interesting to relive these video game dad stories, but now with a little fatherhood experience under my belt. I have a lot more to say on this topic, but that will be for a different, much bigger video. In regards to how it affected last year though, my time with The Witcher 3 and God of War 2018 made it abundantly clear that the lens I use to look at games through has changed forever. While that lens is always shifting, it typically happens gradually, so having the way I view things change so rapidly has felt a bit jarring, but I am excited to see where it leads me moving forward. After getting through my replays of The Witcher 3 and God of War 2018, I jumped back into a steady stream of enjoyable and much shorter games. I played Immortality, which has haunted me since finishing it, but like, in a good way. I played Ukulele in the Impossible Layer, which might be the most slept on game I can think of in recent memory, and I played Symphony of the Night for the first time ever, which really made me want to play Super Metroid, so I did that too. And before I knew it, the end of the year was in sight, which I could barely comprehend. My tiny little baby wasn't so so tiny or little, and she was starting to engage with the world around her more and more, a development I found to be equal parts incredible and horrifying. And I think being at that place in life, of watching my daughter start the very early steps of growing up, made me highly susceptible to be moved by God of War Ragnarok.
Ragnarok expands the scope set by its predecessor in pretty much every conceivable way. The world is larger and more diverse, the combat has greater depth and variation, and the story branches out into something far bigger than a tale about a father and a son learning how to connect with one another. It explores fate, family, friendship, forgiveness, purpose, loss, vengeance, and yeah, also still father and son stuff. And for the most part, it succeeds on all fronts. I know its story and tone are somewhat divisive, but I found both to be entertaining and engaging. The different ways each of the story's themes apply to all of the major characters creates a complex and wide examination of the game's core ideas. There are so many powerful aspects to connect with, but of course, as a recent dad, the thing I related to most was Kratos grappling with the idea of Atreus not needing him in the same way he once did. A large part of Kratos' story is him trying to figure out what role he should play in Atreus' life as the boy becomes the god he was destined to be. Which I get. Obviously, my daughter isn't even talking yet, aside from some ba ba ba's and if I'm lucky, da da da's, so I have no idea what it is like to raise a teenager. But I have come to understand that my role as a dad will constantly change, and one of the hardest things about being a parent has been determining when she is ready for the next big thing, when she is ready for us to let go of it. There have been a handful of times already where my wife and I thought she wasn't old enough or strong enough to try something, so we avoided putting her in certain situations. But in pretty much every instance we did that, we learned that she in fact was ready for those things, and we just needed to give her the chance to do them. And at this point, it's all pretty low stakes stuff, like her feeding herself or taking naps on her own. But as time goes on, those stakes will only get higher, and I'm going to need to find the balance between not holding my daughter back while still protecting her. Ragnarok got me to see myself in a character I never expected to see myself in. And I don't mean to keep bringing stuff up and then saying I'll talk about it more deeply in a different video, but I'll talk about it more deeply in a different video. The final game I played last year was Vampire Survivors. I don't really know what to say about this title aside from it made my brain go burr. In a similar way to Hades, it was a game I heard tons of praise towards, but when I saw footage of it, I struggled to believe it was as good as people said it was. But after finally playing it, I completely understood. It's a dopamine factory that takes just enough thought to keep you engaged while not requiring so much focus that you ever get stressed out. After a busy few months of running the channel, getting sick every other week, and being a dad, it was the perfect way to end off 2022. Normally when I look back at a year, I remember the things that happened within it thematically. The time itself all sort of blends together. It doesn't matter if I experienced something in March or November, I almost always end up viewing things in regards to how they impacted me opposed to the order they actually happened. I've never had much of a reason to reflect on how a year went in a linear fashion. Last year though was different. I watched my daughter grow from a newborn into a terrifyingly mobile infant, and the progression of that transformation will always be burnt in my brain. So much so that when I think about the games I played last year, I can't really organize them by how they made me feel like I usually do. Instead, I can only remember them in relation to my daughter. Elden Ring was when I hadn't met who would soon become one of the two most important people in my life. Tunic was when she was so small and knew that all she could do was sleep, cry, and occasionally track things with her eyes. Rift Apart was when she started smiling. Neon White was when she first slept through the entire night. The Witcher 3 was when she started to laugh, and also when she learned how to roll over, and also when she got her first tooth, and also when she got her second tooth. God, that's a long game. Ukulele in the Impossible Lair was when she started sitting. Symphony of the Night was when she ate her first solid food. God of War Ragnarok was when she got strong enough to grab the slates of her crib and pull herself up to stand. Vampire Survivors was when she crawled for the first time. I don't know if this will always be how I perceive time, the things I play, and my daughter's life, but for this past year, it was. More than ever before, I have a lot going on in life. Thankfully, the vast majority of it is good, but even good stuff requires a lot of thought, energy, and maintenance. I've always used games as a way to help ground me, and 2022 was no different. I have not by any means mastered being a father, or a YouTuber, or even just a person. I still have a lot to learn about how to balance my various roles in life, and with both work and fatherhood, I have no clue what tomorrow will bring. 
What I do know though is that this past year, games were a constant during a time of wild and continuous change. They gave me hope and relief when I needed it, and I know for a fact that 2022 would have been harder without them. There are far more important things in life than games and hobbies in general, but it is surprisingly easy to get consumed by those more important things, to lose yourself in them. And that's why it's important to have something to turn to every once in a while that feels like your own. And for me, that will always be games. So here's to the new year, and hoping that Silk Song actually comes out. And in lieu of a real transition, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a streaming service that is the best place to watch thoughtful, engaging, and fun documentaries. Their library has thousands of titles, and whether you're looking to veg out on something about nature or learn about what advancements we've made in science over the past year, it has you covered. I've been using it for a while now and have never struggled to find something great to watch. Like most recently, I checked out the true story of pirates, which follows a crew of archaeologists on an expedition to investigate a sunken pirate ship, and goes into the many ways of how actual pirates differed from how they've been portrayed in the media. And it was both fun and informative. No matter your interests, you're going to find tons of stuff to watch. And currently, if you sign up for Curiosity Stream by clicking the link in the description, you can get 26% off a year's membership, which comes out to less than $15 for the year. As far as value goes, with what you pay for one month of most other services, you get 365 days of Curiosity Stream, making it an unbeatable deal. It's a really great service that everyone can get something out of, and for less than $15 a year, it's kind of a no-brainer. So check it out, learn something new, and enjoy yourself. Anyway, thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. To all of you still here, hey. I'd like to thank all of my patrons for making this channel possible, as well as a special shout out to William Glenn 8 and Adamo for being honorary bag butans. I appreciate you. With that, I wish you the best in this new year and hope you have a great day and or night. I'll see you in the next one.